October 29, 1929. After a decade of prosperity, the great stock market crash sends shockwaves felt around the world. But the event means little to the people who live on Newfoundland's Huron Peninsula. The island is still 20 years away from becoming a part of Canadian Confederation, an isolated British outpost, poor and underdeveloped. Its inhabitants know little of the world of commerce, save for the uncertain livelihood they harvest from the waters of the Atlantic Ocean. They cannot know that in just a matter of weeks, those same waters will send their own terrible shockwaves that will threaten not only their economy, but also their lives. November 18, 1929. Some 78 towns and villages dot the coastal bays of Newfoundland's Huron Peninsula, home to more than 12,000 inhabitants. Everybody in the, in the community was a fisherman or had something to do with a fisherman. My dad was a fisherman, my grandfather was a fisherman, and his father before him was a fisherman, so you know, that's the way it was. Fishery was the whole reason for Newfoundland, and you had to be as close to the water as possible to make the fishery work. We must build our homes and our working areas right on the rocks. The houses were generally a uh, wooden frame construction, generally handmade, so there were really no building standards. None of them would have been anchored to concrete or any solid uh, rock foundations. Three-year-old Margaret Rennie is one of six children living with their parents in Lord's Cove, a village typical of the coastal communities along the Buren Peninsula. Lord's Cove is not a very big place, and there's a flat land like not many houses there. It's open to the sea. High tides are normal for this time of the month, but this particular November day is unusually pleasant. It was just one of these beautiful days you got caught up in being outdoors and being involved in, in what you were doing. In the village of St. Lawrence, Levi Pike plays beside the home of a friend. It is just after five in the afternoon. All of a sudden the house started to tremble, sort of move, you know. I didn't think it was unusual in a way because his mother had a sewing machine right up by that window inside and it used to make a lot of noise. A lot of times well, that's just a sewing machine going, you know. In the village of Point O'Gall, Lancelot Hillier's mother thinks his older brother is the cause of the tremor. I was on the boat upstairs, and they were saying, it was upstairs, so I was up saying, dancing, a big man, for dancing, John. That's what she said, that's what she said. She said, no, she wanted to start dancing. Lancelot's 10-year-old cousin, Leslie, also lives in Point O'Gall. And there were some pools of water, frozen over. And the ground was shaking, you could hear the ice, like it's rattling almost the same as you had ice in, in a large tumbler. Just down the road, another relative, eight-year-old Nora Hillier, is having a similar experience. Well, I was in the house, and uh, the panes of glass in the window, you could see them. the pictures on the wall, the dishes in the cupboard, everything just shook, but it didn't last very long. While it lasts only a few minutes, the earthquake is felt all across eastern Canada. Now, even as far away as St. John's, the, the capital of Newfoundland, I spoke with people whose kitchen chimneys rattled. I, I spoke with a woman who was working in Grand Falls in central Newfoundland, as far away from the water, the salt water, as you could possibly get in Newfoundland, and her typewriter danced across the table. 
earthquake was felt all the way to Montreal and even in Ottawa, as far south as New York City. People felt that event. The epicenter for the 1929 earthquake, magnitude 7.2, a very large earthquake. It was about 250 kilometers straight south of the Burien Peninsula, a full 20 kilometers below sea level. So it's a very deep earthquake. Of course, it all came to an end. People gathered, talked. But then we thought, of course, well, there's nothing else going to happen. In the generations living on the Vera Peninsula at that time, I don't think any of them had any experience with, certainly with earthquakes or tsunamis, unless they had experienced it somewhere uh, outside. Um, they would have had no experience with, uh, with this phenomenon at all. There are those who don't agree, who recognize the tremor for what it is, and who know what can follow. We had a man in Panagal, Uncle Joe Miller, little old man. Poor old man got down the ground and kissed the ground. He squeezed it right away. <laughs> well, no one never bothered him. French man. <laughs> <laughs> There are others on the island who seem to share the old man's concern. Horses grazing on an outcropping in Point O'Gall move inland, heading for the hills and higher ground. It is a warning that also goes unheeded. Deep in the Atlantic Ocean, 250 kilometers away, the massive earthquake loosens an immense section of the continental shelf. 200 cubic kilometers of material slides down the slope. You can have a submarine slow fail, very much like an avalanche in, uh, on a mountain, and then suddenly the whole mountain of sand you know, just goes. The massive underwater movement sets off vibrations in the ocean, radiating outward like ripples in a pond. But these ripples are dense currents carrying clay, silt, and sand moving at 100 kilometers an hour. The phenomenon is known as a tsunami. What a tsunami is, is essentially a wave created on the surface of the ocean by a sudden movement of the soil or the ocean floor. And that wave can travel at tremendous speeds. The tsunami surges northward, heading straight for the south coast of Newfoundland. Its target, the communities of the Buren Peninsula. November 18th, 1929, 7.30 p.m. It has been more than two hours since the tremors of an offshore earthquake rumbled across the island of Newfoundland. In communities along the coast of the Buren Peninsula, the event has caused little concern. It is a calm, clear, moonlit evening, and life goes on as usual. In Point O'Gall, five-year-old Lancelot Hillier is at home with his mother. After it's off, the father went up to the temple. He probably went up, come up here. So the social was put on here. So he made me about her left. She was spinning wool. His only sister, 11-year-old Varina, is staying overnight at their grandparents' house closer to shore. Her grandmother is also looking after three cousins. In Lord's Cove, 13-year-old Mary Walsh calls her widowed father to their front porch. The cove near their home has been completely drained of water. The first inkling that something big was happening was when the water left the cove, leaving boats dry on the bottom. And when they then looked Offshore, they can see a wall of water coming towards them. In Point O'Gall, Nora Hillier and three older sisters are home alone when they hear a noise outside. I decided to look out the window and I said, Oh, the sheep. You know, woolly sheep. But this was 
Sifo. And it was coming. And of course it came fast. Well, the height of the tsunami in the open ocean is only a couple of inches. It's, but as it comes in, it has to get rid of energy. It tears up the bottom, it rises in height, and you eventually get a, a break in the way. In Lawrence Cove, Mary Walsh and her father witness the wave's arrival. The wave is so high, it seems to come not from the sea, but from the sky. There's no such thing as a typical tsunami, but what we do have is typical impact of the tsunami. It's always will be concentrated where you have narrow bays, and common points, peninsulas that stick out. They become targets and we tend to focus the tsunami energy. The wall of water is more than 20 kilometers long and hits the southeast coast of the Buran Peninsula in one massive sweep. It ranged from Rock Harbor, which is well up on the um, eastern side of the peninsula, quite a few kilometers, down around to Lamoline, which is on the very bottom. In Point of Dawn, Nora Hillier and her sisters are trapped in waste pond water as their house moves with the roaring tide. About six feet up before they got to the house. Burst in. So the older sister went to the door. And of course, we followed her we going before the walk. Because the wreckage came with the walk. As the house was moving, it was must have hit this rock and came into the wreckage. And we came as well. So that's Above the cove at Point O'Gall, a neighbor tells Lancelot Hillier and his mother that the giant wave won't be the last. Poor man at door. The wave comes from the top of the bank. And the other one doesn't throw it. The other one comes out of the bank. It appears to have been something like 15 minutes between to the waves so over the space of a half an hour three waves. Even with time between the waves, there are some who don't get the chance to run. Lancelot Hillier's sister, Verena, is trapped with her grandmother and two cousins when the second wave takes her grandparents' house out to sea. My grandfather was out at the time wave came in, certainly he rushed home, only when he got to the gate, there was no home. When the waves hit Lord's Cove, Sarah Rennie was in the kitchen with several of her children. Three-year-old daughter Margaret is in bed on the seventh floor. The Rennie house was lifted from its foundation, swept in land, back out across the bar into the main harbor, and this, of course, is when the whole first floor would have been flooded. In another part of Lord's Cove, Mary Walsh and her father escaped the waves, but not before James Walsh retrieved something especially close to his heart. Her father ran upstairs to the bedroom, all over the bureau and the drawer, and pulled out a burned handle, ran downstairs, ran up to the bank, and when she asked him why, it was to bring luck. This candle apparently had been used in the uh, death ranks when this wing was in, and stuck the candle in a link of chain uh, attached to his coach there, and his property sustained very little damage. In his home above the village of St. Lawrence, young Levi Pike has miraculously slept through the tsunami's arrival. But he will never forget the destruction of leaves behind. Dad came up with a house for something and took me with him down on the road. On the road side of it, you could see the wreckage going around the harbor. 
All along the Bjorn Peninsula, harbors are filled with debris that was once boats, fishing equipment, and storehouses filled with winter provisions. Houses float on the water. Kerosene lights still burn in the rain. Well, everybody, typical of Newfoundland, jumped in to do whatever they could. There were people trying to rescue goods and household stuff. And obviously, people first. In Point O'Gall, Nora Hillier's father rescues his daughters from their partially submerged house. Then we had to go to higher land. And as we walked up from our house to get to where we were going, in the water edge, us all on the roads, we couldn't get by. We had to go different ways to get through. Sometimes climb over the roads. Get in Lord's Cove, James Walsh's first concern is the home of Sarah Ray. She, uh, somebody just ran down to the beach and got the door and went to the to see if they could rescue the Rennies. The lower part of the house is submerged, but Walsh and the others are able to enter through an upstairs window. They find little Margaret Rennie still in her bed. The only thing I do remember of the lamp is on the stair hidden the window. They brought me to a house there in Lars Cole and put me down in a, a big uh, tub of warm water. They managed to, with block and tackle, get the house up onto the beach and they discovered Mrs. Rennie and uh, three of Margaret's siblings uh, in the lower level of the house and they, they were dead, they had drowned. Mom was standing under the table. She was sewing at the table with her sewing machine. Petri, he was found under the couch. The baby burnt was tied in the hot chair. I haven't got a picture of any of them. Poor mom, I don't even know what she looks like. By daylight the next morning, it was a storm had come up, strong wind from the south, and, and uh, things was washing ashore and breaking up. So we had the whole shoreline was lined with debris by noon the next day. It was so thick that kids could actually walk across, and there was one young fellow that he used to go across, jumping from wood to wood to wood, and that was fine until he suddenly fell backwards, and he grabbed and he was holding onto the hair of an 80-year-old woman whose body they hadn't found. Many more bodies are found. Wancelot Hillier's grandmother and three cousins are found drowned in his grandparents' home. His 11-year-old sister, Verena, is not with them. For the next week, Verena's father searches the beach for his lost daughter. Yeah, you every morning he'd get up and go away with the boat for He come back this morning, that was seven days. He come up to me, me and the other band, and she come up and I found her. Then the only thing was missing, I just wonder if it was that. With telegraph lines down, it is several days before news of the disaster goes beyond the Buren Peninsula. There were nearly 50 communities which had recorded damage. 800 families suffered losses of, of tangible property. The following year, uh, in, in the summer, the houses were, were rebuilt, uh, fishing premises, uh, stages, and wharves were, had been rebuilt, but the fishery failed that summer, and for the next nine, ten years, the fishery on the south coast um, was practically non-existent. In the end, the tsunami takes 28 lives, 
including a young girl from Taylor's Bay who dies four months after the event. The Buren tsunami still stands as the worst disaster of its kind in Canadian history and remains a part of Newfoundland folklore. People know about it because it's handed down from their parents or grandparents or whatever. But as far as personal experience goes, there's very few people, you know, that, that can remember it. My children don't know what a tidal wave is, but that tidal wave could come tomorrow. Th that feeling is always with me. Could something like this happen again? Cracks have been discovered in the ocean floor off the east coast of the United States that could lead to a submarine slide similar to the one that caused the Buren tsunami. I guess it, it taught us, it taught a lot of people that things can happen unexpectedly and natural forces can occur. And so people should be always aware that this could happen again and be ready in case it does. <laughs>